Hi there. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. It's great to have you with us. I decided to record outside today, so just ignore all the leaf blowers and dogs and things that are in the background. Our reading for today, the last, this is the last Sunday in Easter. Next week is Pentecost. Um, and so uh, we're still celebrating Easter this last week. We celebrated Ascension and we had a little Bible study on that. So let's read this last Easter reading. This is from John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. The words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. While we're in Easter, today's Gospel passage reflects an event which happened during Holy Week. Jesus just ate the Last Supper with his disciples. He washed the disciples' feet. Judas left the room soon to betray Jesus. And then Jesus teaches, and he takes a long time. He teaches those who are left from the table. From chapter 13 until chapter 16, Jesus is attempting to teach his disciples. I say attempting because they don't quite get it. Okay, what you're going to see is a video, and this is a like, um, like a quiz. <laughs> so you need to count how many times the players wearing white in this video pass the ball. So just, okay, so really focus on how many times the players in white pass the ball, the number of passes, and then we'll quiz you at the end and see how you do. Now, this may seem like a very strange thing. What, what happens is many of you who saw the video saw the gorilla that went through. Some of you were so focused on the white shirts and counting the white shirts that you didn't see him, right? You, in fact, you may even be wondering what I'm talking about. Others of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the funny thing is, is that 50%, seriously, 50% of the people that watch this video miss the a monkey, they miss the gorilla. They also miss the fact, if you, did, if you caught the gorilla, they miss the fact that the curtain in the background changes and or they miss the fact that there's a woman dressed in black who actually leaves, right? So we're going to watch it again and watch for those things. So when you're looking for a gorilla, <laughs> you you often miss other events. Uh, you often miss other things. It's easy to get caught up in things. It's easy to miss the obvious and even miss the important thing. After Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, this is in the very beginning of Jesus's long sermon. Then he says something that's incredibly important, and the apostle Peter misses it. He is distracted. 
Peter and probably the rest of the disciples are in their heads. They're trying to figure out the whole thing instead of actually listening to Jesus. They, they miss the gorilla. They, get, they miss the big picture. Not So some of you probably got it. Others could not see the field for the trees. And this happens so often in everyday life. life. Um, I will look for the, the place that I thought I left my keys. And I thought I had looked there four times, but the fourth time I see it. Why couldn't I see it the other times? Why? Because I'm distracted. I'm looking for something different. I'm in my head. I'm confused. So what Peter missed was profound. What Jesus said that was incredibly important was not that he was going away, although that was important. The big thing that, that Jesus wanted to convey was that you must love each other as I have loved you. And the truth is, no matter how hard he tried, Jesus could not tell them what was to happen about his death in a way that they could understand. He would have to show them. That's what love is. And that's what Good Friday is all about, showing his love to them, to love one another. That's the important part. And that's what I'm doing for you, Jesus told them. Since I was a little shy when I was in high school, I didn't ask out many girls out on dates. and said, hey, I've lined up for you a great date for Saturday night. It's all set. Who is it? I asked. It turned out to be his cousin Doris. I had never met her. In fact, I had never met any girl named Doris. Oh, no, I said, I'm not going on a blind date. And he says, don't worry about this one, my friend. I said, Doris is a terrific girl. And just trust me, she's a real looker. But if you don't believe me, I'll tell you how to get out of the date. If you don't like the way she looks, just this is what I do. I go to a, a girl's front door and pick her up. And when she opens the door, I check her out. If I like what I see, then great. We're all set. But if she's ugly, then I fake an asthma attack. I go, oh! And the girl ask what's wrong and I say you know it's asthma I have to go and call off the date you know I'm sorry about this well I didn't know but okay it sounded easy enough so I'll go and do it I said so I went to pick up Doris and I knocked on the door and she came to the front door and to her surprise my friend was right she was beautiful and I stood there not knowing exactly what to say and she took one look at me and she went ah <gasps> Chances are you've also been rejected from time to time. But God doesn't look at us the way that we look at others. When he takes a look at us, he thinks we're beautiful. He accepts us for the way we are. It doesn't matter what we believe or our political persuasion or whether or not we wear a mask. God isn't concerned about how we look. He's more concerned about what's inside. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, 1 Samuel 16, 7. God wants us to have a heart like his, one that reaches out and loves all people. And Jesus is a good example. Even though the disciples are not understanding, even though they're not trying, they're trying to better each other, it's clear that Jesus loves his disciples. And so this last speech that Jesus preaches to them is really all about Jesus' love. After all, he has spent the better part of every waking hour with this group. He cares for them. He loves them. And he's ready to give them some amazing gifts. The gifts of eternal life, the gift of peace, the gift of the Holy Spirit, power from on high, assuring them that he will, in his words, never leave them orphaned. Not only after that, Jesus separates the disciples from everyone else. In this, one of the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Why is it? Why is that the case? And that is always a question that we must ask ourselves. Why did Jesus pick you and me to be a part of his crew, to love and to endow not only with gifts, but his love? It says in 1 John 4.10, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. In the end of chapter 17, the, the part that I just read for today, Jesus prays. And Jesus' prayer to God is for his disciples and for us. 
This prayer summarizes the previous four chapters, and it emphasizes the idea that Jesus will no longer be our teacher, but actually live inside of us. Through the Holy Spirit, God will be in us, helping to guide us from the inside. This presence is described as the vine and the branches. This is a personal joining of ourselves with Jesus. And what is the symbol of that joining? Is it confessing with one's mouth? Is it being a member of a church? Is it in knowing the Lord's Supper or the Apostles' Creed? No, what, what shows others that a person is in Christ is his or her love to other Christians, for other Christians. That's what Jesus said. The proof that Jesus gave this, his great symbol of faith, was his laying down his life for us, John 15, 13. So in short, where there is no love for other Christians, there is no Christianity, pure and simple. Forms, formulas, doctrines, even Scripture itself means nothing if a Christian does not honestly and intensely and regularly love others, especially other Christians. In the long span of the church's life, the basic crime tends to be hatred of the other. And this is the death of Agape, the Greek word for unconditional love, the kind of love that God has for you and me, for, for the world. The kind of love that we're supposed to have for each other. This kind of love God gives to us, this is the kind of love mentioned in John chapter 17. And as a pastor, my task is to preach it and live it. Several years ago, Betty Polkingham arranged an amazing song. When I was a child, I sang it, and it's still so amazing. Love, 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 love. The gospel in one word is love. Love your neighbor as your family. Love, love, love. Amy Carmichael once said in her poem, If... If I belittle those who I am called to serve, talk of their weak points, in contrast perhaps with what I think of as my strong points, if I adopt a superior attitude forgetting who made thee to differ, and what hast thou that thou hast not received, even I know nothing of Calvary love. If I take offense easily, if I am content to continue in a cool unfriendliness, though friendship is possible, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I feel bitterly towards those who condemn me, as it seems to me unjustly, forgetting if they knew me as I know myself, they would condemn me much more than I know nothing of Calvary love. St. Michael's had always been a, a very wealthy church. Its 300 members usually gave a combined annual offering of over $1 million because they could afford to over the years. However, the neighborhood around the beautiful old church began to change. Immigrants flocked to the area, changing the com complexion of the community. Steel bars replaced welcome signs and store windows. Homeless people would be found wandering the sidewalks and streets. The changes made some members of the St. Michael's community very uncomfortable, and they usually tried to avoid that part of the town, except on Sundays. One Sunday, shortly after a young associate priest had joined the church staff, the church members were gathered after the morning service for coffee and pastries, and in the spring months, they loved to gather in the flower garden outside the church, and among its gazebos, fountains, and vine-covered arches, as the elegantly dressed worshippers sipped coffee and chatted in the garden, a homeless man shuffled in off the street. He entered through the garden gate without looking at anyone, but all the eyes were certainly on him. He quietly walked over to the table where he, a spread of expensive pastries were displayed on silver trays. He picked up one of the pastries and bit into it, keeping his eyes closed. Then he reached for a second pastry and placed it into his coat pocket, moving slowly and trying not to be noticed. He placed another one into the same pocket. The garden buzzed with worshipers. Finally, one of the women walked over to the new priest and said, Well, do something! Still feeling a little awkward in his new position, the young 
Priest handed his coffee cup to the woman, walked over to the table, and stood next to the homeless man. He reached under the table where the empty pastry boxes had been stored. Then he picked up one of the silver trays loaded with pastries and emptied them into the box. He did the same with the second tray of expensive goodies. And then he closed the lids of the boxes and held them out to the homeless man who were here every Sunday. The priest said, the man smiled at the priest, cradled the boxes in his arms, and shuffled quietly out of the garden and down to the street. The priest returned to the, with his coffee cup and smiled at the woman holding it and said, Well, that, that's what you meant for me to do when you said do something, wasn't it? What would you have done if you had been that priest? And that's an, an important question for all of us. Jesus looks out at the homeless and the weak in this world. And he says to each of us, well, do something. Certainly, if Jesus were here in the flesh, you can bet he would have done something very much like that young priest did. We know that we're sinful. We know that we miss the gorilla in the room because we're watching the white shirts. So the challenge is to dedicate oneself to love. All our life as a church, everything we do from being a pastor to being a bishop to singing the psalms and the hymns of the faith needs to be done as an outpouring of our aspect of love for each other. Someone once said, there must be a place in a community of charity for synods and open hearings and sanctions and committees and even budgets, but especially for love. Love has consequences. Will you pray with me? Lord, today we're challenged with your gospel. Like the disciples 2,000 years ago, we often miss your teaching to love one another, even as you have loved us. Help us to translate our faith in you into Christian love and help us to love beyond the culture, creed, and politics of those we tend to be in conflict with. Help us to give up our own eagles, help us to love in the midst of differences, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of our own problems. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray.